So uh, I think you can start. We can start. And uh, uh, first, I would like to complete the, the, the information I was providing about uh, the different components that make together a solid rocket motor, and in particular, describes the, the point where we uh, were is uh, talking about some application. Uh, just we have to to say a few more words about the components. And here uh, you you see that we have. Uh, so the last slide I showed yesterday, if I remember where was this one, and this is related to the, the nozzle. And uh, we were uh, talking about it, this thermal protection that is clearly uh, it's evident here. Uh, on this nozzle, and uh, and you see that we have different possible options about uh, how to uh, let's say arrange the nozzle with the propellant grain, and you see that it can be more or less submerged within the case. Here you see that just in uh, Figure C, you see just that uh, only the divergent section is out of the case, but it's completely submerged the nozzle in, within the uh, within the the, the 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 case here, and this doesn't work properly, so it's better we write. Okay, uh, in this other case, it's completely uh, out of the case. And this is uh, an example also of an extendable cone that can be deployed in case you are uh, in a higher stages, um, not in a first stage. And uh, here is also another example where you see this arrow in B, where it's emphasized uh, as you can move the nozzle to an angle up to an angle alpha to get thrust vectoring. So these are just few examples. And uh, here, uh, this is the, the space shuttle booster. And uh, here, what is highlighted is that this uh, big booster is highlighted in different parts. And they are called segments. And uh, the reason is because if we have something that is too long, it can be subjected to loads that can uh, create cracks that are not uh, desired in, in a solid rocket. You, you know, if we have a crack somewhere where can be some hot gas, of course it will burn the propellant inside the grain and this will easily lead to uh, explosion. So leakages, of course, inside the propellant must be avoided. And you see also here that you have a star on, on top and you have a conical shape on the lower part. So the grain design, of course, once more, is something that allows you to get the trust profile you decide. Of course, you have to design it in advance. You cannot control during flight. This is one of the uh, limits of a solid proportion that have to be underlined. Uh, so this is again uh, the same rocket, which is uh, where they are shown the different parts. You see the different segments, and here there is also different length in feet and inches, as American like. And here is uh, another uh, launcher made mainly of solid rockets and this Vega launcher. And where you see that we have, uh, this is the, the present Vega that this night should be uh, launched again. And uh, uh, we have three solid stages, uh, P80, P Z23, and Z9, respectively this one, this one, this one, and this one. And uh, so you see that the only 
liquid propellant based stage is the fourth one. This one here, you see that only a small amount of propellant is used there. And this is to adjust under common the final orbit. Uh, and of course, if you want to shut down the engine at a given time, when you reach your final orbit, you need to uh, be capable to stop it when uh, you decide. So this, the, the, higher, the upper stage is a liquid one. This is the avium. Uh, uh, yes, you see here uh, also something inside the different stages of uh, the Vega rocket. And here is another picture. So, but more or less, you, you see the same uh, drawing. The difference you see is that uh, the, the uh, Zephyron is a smaller amount of propellant. So you see that it's almost, it's nearly three dimensional because the diameter and length are more or less the same. And you also can uh, uh, see in this picture the different expansion ratio that you have at the different stages. And the uh, Zephyro 9 is designed with uh, another that aims to have maximum performance in vacuum conditions. And so you see a high expansion ratio compared to the first stage that, of course, is limited by the atmospheric pressure and so as a limited elevation. Of course, the second stage would work mostly in absence of atmosphere because the first stage brings you high enough that the ambient pressure is already small in that case. So here is not uh, as high as uh, Zephyro 9, the exponential ratio, but of course it's higher than the first stage. The reason of the expansion ratio, of course, is also related to the uh, trust level you are producing and to the cross section available. So uh, you know that here, you see that here we can consider a smaller trot for Zephyro 9. And so with the same exit area, you can reach a higher expansion ratio. Here is a list for, uh, of different, uh, either historical or uh, uh, present uh, solid rocket motors. And uh, you see that there is a group of them which is used for boosters, uh, for Titan, for RM5, for uh, Space Shuttle, and these are usually big ones. And uh, you see that more or less they hold the case diameter of between three and four meters. But you see that length or height can be uh, very large. Aside, as large as about 40 meters for the space shuttle. And uh, so the Ariane 5 boosters are slightly scaled down with respect to that of uh, space shuttle. And so you see here also the length of the diameter, which is about 10 for the, the, the these cases. And also you see a big short diameter. That means that this kind of uh, boosters are allowed to get a very high thrust. Recall that thrust is related to chamber pressure, throat area, and thrust coefficient. Thrust coefficient will change not more than 50% considering a wide range. So actually you have not so high pressure uh, or at you have 10 of bars of course can be 50, 70, 60. And uh, of course the thrust is given mostly by the thrust diameter from the mass flow rate we are using. Uh, then you see the Motors uh, of Vega, first, second, third stage, uh, with some properties here. I will mention uh, 
them also later. And then you have this booster here, but, but you see you can compare the diameter that tells you about truss level. Of course, you have to imagine that this is the truss is proportional to square diameter because it's proportional to the trot area. So you have 0.5 compared to one means that one fourth uh, the trust is expected. And uh, then other applications, these are booster for uh, delta launcher, for delta delta two launcher, and consider these are uh, is something that could be applied or not to that launcher. And today we have also booster of that can be considered for application or not in the Atlas V launcher that uh, allow to increase the payload a little bit, so to have a range of different payloads with different uh, for the same launcher, for mostly the same launcher, except for these boosters. Then you see this, uh, the list of these upper stages where you see this red line on the left, and uh, these are, you see the L over D is more or less order one. And so this tell you that we are uh, talking about three dimensional uh, grains. And this is typical of upper stages where you have not such a huge amount of propellant. So with, uh, let's say, acceptable diameter, you can have, uh, you can include the whole amount of propellant you need. And you see again that the, the not the trot diameter is still is further uh, reduced because you have small trust level in this case. And finally, you see uh, the, the three stages of another fully solid rocket, which is the uh, Pegasus launcher. Pegasus launcher is a launcher, uh, an air launched uh, rocket that uh, so starts at 10 kilometers uh, on board of uh, an airplane and is released at that uh, altitude and then it will be accelerated up to the other stages, uh, three solid stages. And uh, of course, this gives you a little improvement. Uh, because you have you, you're starting at a higher altitude and you reduce, uh, especially you reduce the gravitational losses and the uh, aerodynamic. <laughs> Next, so this is just a, a nice picture that I found on the web where uh, you see the different uh, solid rockets that uh, the, the, the most uh, important are all there uh, present, they are not future. So you see another one that is uh, in present will, is being realized, you don't see here, and uh, but you have more or less of them. And you see that uh, the scale can be quite different from each other. And uh, let's compare something. Uh, you see here, there are the three stages of Vega. The first stage, second stage, third stage, all together are smaller than the, the booster of Ariane 5, which in turn is, is, is smaller than the shutter one, space shutter one. But you see that we have also very small rockets. Mm. And this is for upper stage. Uh, yes, here there is the, the future that should be next year. Uh, and uh, that still see the use of uh, solid rocket in the future in Europe is made of uh, Ariane 6 and Vega C. And uh, here you see the, the, the solution that has been chosen by the European Space Agency that uh, consider the same solid rocket model to be used as a booster for the Ariane 6 
and at the first stage for the Vega C. This will be called the P120. And you see here some images, of course, these are drawings because uh, uh, the rocket is still to fly. And uh, possibly it's for a scene for the first half of next year, the uh, Vega C and the second half, Ariane 6. Here you see the Vega family. So talking about solid rocket motors, uh, we have to underline that this is something that is being produced in Colefero from Mario. So we have uh, an important uh, industry working on this. And also it's important to, to stress that one of the launchers provided by Europe, there are two in practice, because yes, we have also so used, but it's, of course, it's partly, it's only uh, sell by Arian Group, uh, Arian Space, sorry. And, uh, but actually it's built, uh, it's built in Russia. And uh, so in Vega we have, uh, you see the number of solid rocket motors that have been realized here, PAT, uh, of course, it's not only Avio, but uh, they are working together with in, in a consortium called Euro Propulsion. And you have Zephyro 23, Zephyro 9, P120C, uh, Zephyro 40. Ciao. Ciao. Scusa, mi è stato scambio, è stato. Mi hanno detto che tu non avevi più bisogno dell'aula. Non è vero, però. Mi dispiace. No, scu scusami, io non ho parlato con te perché davo per scontato che, che non no, avevi. No, perché noi siamo perpendicolari. Con la tua, la tua seconda parte e il mio corso non hanno sovrapposizione. Nel senso che quelli che fanno rocket propulsion non fanno sensori ottici. Ok, va bene. Però c'è un problema andava in 24 a quest'ora, quindi in teoria sarebbe venuto comunque Non l'ho visto, non l'ho visto. No, mi dispiace, comunque se vuoi... Per il futuro, per i prossimi mercoledì, dimmi tu, cioè io rimango... No, infatti, adesso ne parlerò con loro e mi vedrò le conseguenze. Va però dai, ci ci siamo. Ok, grazie. Scusa. Niente, figure. Scusami. So, you see here different uh, solid rocket models in the Vega family. We have P80, Z023, Z09, P120, C, Z040, Z09 again. And also they are combined a different way, including a Z02 here, which is a smaller one for a mini launcher that can be of interest. So today there is what's talking, showing this, this picture. I move a little bit from rocket propulsion and talk also, I give also you some information about launchers. And today there is an interest uh, towards small launchers. So small launchers means something less than uh, 1000 kilograms in low orbit. And uh, there is an interest, but be careful because we said at the beginning of the course that small launchers are less efficient as big ones. So why there is this interest? It's because as we have uh, small payloads, smaller and smaller payloads today because of the miniaturization of satellites, possibly there is someone that is available that wish to spend more but to have a dedicated launch rather than to be a passenger on a bigger launcher. Because, of course, in that case, if you, are, uh, you have your own satellite in a, in a mission, which is 
governed by the main payload to have less choices about the final orbit with respect to what you can do by your own launcher. So it's difficult to say that this will be convenient in, uh, from a commercial point of view, but today there is an interest towards developing small launchers. And there are many startups that are trying to find their room uh, to, to provide this kind of services. So this is why you see here also a possible option, which is this Vega C light or Vega light that includes, you see here is part of, is the second and third stage of Vega C with a smaller third stage that should make, uh, should bring in orbit something like uh, a few hundred kilograms of pain. And here, uh, so these numbers that you see, 80, 23, 9, 120, 40, more or less represents the amount of propellant of uh, the, each rocket. So this should be read as nine tons, 23 tons, 80 tons of propellant. Of course, it's something that the number is given at the beginning of development, then there can be changes. And so, for instance, you have that here, this P80 will be 88 tons. And, uh, and so on. Or uh, theta 40 is 36 tons, 23 is 24, so something like this. And what is not here, but was shown here, is uh, this one, the CAP, is uh, our P230. So you see how big it is. And actually, it includes. Uh, 240 tons of propellant. And the trust level will be up to order of mega newtons. So we have the seven mega newtons or 700 tons for the P230 up to the 0.3 mega newton or 300 kilonewton or 30 tons for the Zeta 9, the Zephyr 9. So this is an example of testing of solid rocket model. Of course, here uh, you have one considering this kind of test, what you have to take into account. We talked that we have two kinds of main pollutants and uh, one we talked about is that as we use typically ammonium perchlorate we will have hydrochloric acid in this smoke and so you have of course to to be to, to keep it safe for possible for people that can uh, encounter this cloud or uh, and the other pollutant that we can consider is alumina because this is powder that uh, can be also of uh, of different sides and can be also dangerous so when you design so for all rockets you have also to consider that you have to test them and you have to find a way that these tests are safe enough so in uh, selecting the location the kind of uh, uh, let's say, respect to the environment today. And uh, this is uh, a big one, which is bigger than the Space Shuttle Booster. Uh, if I remember well, it has one segment more and uh, should be the, or will be, the boosters for the new uh, NASA Space Launch System for the Artemis mission. And uh, of our Artemis program to go back to the moon. And uh, here you see how it's tested in some desert zone in Utah in the United States. So you see that it's tested in a horizontal position because of its size. 
and this is uh, foreseen for the next use in different versions of this SLS launcher. That will work a couple of minutes and then will be separated this kind of booster during uh, the launch phase. So it mostly provides the needed trust at uh, at sea level. Scusi, professore, una domanda. <clears throat> so this was about uh, solid rocket. And uh, no. So now you should be you should see the board. And uh, first of all, I'd like to give you an information. Information is that uh, uh, not this Friday, next one uh, on May 7. Uh, during our uh, hours, there will be uh, a lecture given by Professor Jean Jacques Urdin, who was a uh, former uh, director of uh, European Space Agency. And uh, so I hope that you will uh, listen to him with interest. He will talk about uh, launchers. I'll give you also the information on, the, on uh, our sites, but launcher future and lessons learned from the past. So he's a person who worked on this field since for a long time. Now he's retired, but he uh, was uh, in charge of uh, launchers and of ESA direction when there was development of Ariane 4, Ariane 5, and uh, so with successes and failures. So he for sure will uh, give us uh, a nice lecture and I hope that you can also interact with him with possible questions. And this lesson will be shared with uh, the student of um, the second level master of space transportation systems and reentry vehicles that we have here uh, in Sapienza. So, given this information, at this point we have to move to the second big family of rockets. So, we have yeah. also to consider, or we have also to discuss about liquid propellant rocket engines. So, of course, we start saying that uh, we have to store our propellant in some way. And uh, what we do, of course, is to find a condensed uh, phase for one reason, because it occupies less volume. Else, it could be also convenient to to select uh, a gaseous propellant, why not? So the reason comes from the from the density of propellants, and consider that liquid phase or solid phase, of course, solid are denser, but not order of magnitudes as it happens with respect to gases. So it can be two, two or three orders of magnitudes between condensed phase, that means liquid or solid, and the gases. So liquids can be of interest. And uh, for this reason, and actually we are used with liquids, uh, for instance, our cards. And uh, the convenience of liquids is that you can more easily control them with respect to solids. But of course, 
the fact that you can't control them and uh, in some way you can uh, handle in different ways this propellant makes things more complicated. So advantages, you control, drawback, it's more complicated. Uh, yes, however, we have to uh, consider that even if uh, in the history, if you go back to the Chinese uh, on, on the very beginning, centuries ago, there was something that were rocket, were solid rockets. If we go to the modern uh, space age, actually the, the first rockets were uh, based on liquid propellants. So it was the period where we, we, there was development of uh, airplanes, of uh, cars, and so there was something that we were used, people were, were was used with uh, gasoline, gasoline, and uh, so of course try to to work on it, also to develop the uh, the new rockets. And in fact, you find the first application that includes gasoline and oxygen or uh, alcohol, which is also very not known uh, fuel with uh, oxygen as propellants. But we will go, of course, in details about the propellants later. However, it must be said that overall, is the most common way of realizing rocket is based on liquid propellants. And this is true for both launchers and spacecrafts. So you find liquids on board of launchers, typically on most of launchers and on most of spacecrafts. Uh, we have always to, to use the, the word most because there are exceptions. So if we consider our liquid propellant rockets, uh, we should consider the, the whole system as we did for the solid one. And uh, I tried to, to make a, a schematic here, as we did at the beginning when we talked about solid rocket. You see here it was just this, we have the propellant, we have the converging diverging nozzle, and then we can have an igniter and so on. So if you have to compare this with a liquid rocket engines, we should consider where the, we find the propellants, where we find the transfer. Let's say the combustion here is along this surface, and you have to identify also the combustion that occurs in liquid rocket engines. So we are always talking about chemical rockets. They call it. And uh, so we had identified the corresponding parts. And we, uh, at this point, we have to consider somewhere we have the propellant. Let's consider single tank for the moment. And then we have our converging diverging nozzle. So the difference is that in this case, we have propellant here, which is in liquid phase. And here is solid. So we are not burning here in the tank. But we have to transfer this liquid to here, where we have our converging averaging nozzle. And there will be, let's say, something here where we have combustion or reaction. So you see that even if we are just talking about tank, 
transfer of propellant from the tank to a combustion chamber. And then to a nozzle, you see that it's already more complicated. Of course, you also here you have to ignite. So overall, uh, and this is just with a single tank, we will see and we will comment that we will have at least two tanks, but typically also, I would say at least three. Uh, then here you have just to ignite, here you have to do more. We have to open a valve here and then to ignite in the chamber. So typically you have a fuel and oxidizer separate and they should mix and burn in the chamber. And uh, we define the different parts as the thrust chamber, let's say this is the, the core, of our engine is where we have that propellants are burned and they are expanded to get our exo speed. So should be this we have a head here and this will be called the thrust chamber. Then we have of course, we will discuss this in detail. Then we have our tanks. To store propellant. And we have uh, a feed mechanism. To force liquids in the thrust chamber. That includes uh, piping. It may include power source. So that could be piping. There can be a power source to provide energy to the feed mechanism. This can be done in different ways. And then, uh, here you see the case, here we have in some way to connect things together. So we have this tank that should be in some way connected structurally to the thrust chamber to push, to transfer the thrust from the nozzle to the, uh, to the from the thrust chamber, sorry, to the whole uh, stage. And so you have typically that here we have some case that includes everything. And then of course you have, a, so you, let's say you have a structure to transmit forces, and finally have control devices. Control devices can be valves or of different kinds. Or also you can consider here some gimbaling to have a truss vectoring. So you can change, you can move your truss chamber with respect to the structure also here as considered in case of solid rocket to have thrust vectoring so to change to, to control the direction of thrust with an angle with respect to the axis of uh, the launcher itself so uh, different possible solution different ways of realizing uh, liquid rocket engines that depends on the application first and uh, application means size, means thrust profile, means kind of propellants that we will use. 
And uh, among the application where we use liquid propellant rocket engines, we should consider uh, we can divide them uh, in this way. We can consider boosters. They are not necessarily uh, solid rocket motors. They can also be liquid. And uh, just as an example, the Ariane 4 launcher had available different kind of boosters. Uh, it could work with two liquids and two solid, with four solid, with four liquids. And uh, depending on the booster, so the selected booster you have, more or less payload that you, that one could uh, achieve at uh, final order. So we have boosters. So boosters are the stages, uh, the, the, the rockets that we use to accelerate in the lift of phase, so to provide a high thrust level that we need at the beginning, and they typically provide the largest thrust and the highest pressure. And wh why they have the highest pressure is because we have uh, everything which is operating at sea level needs high pressure to uh, counteract the atmospheric pressure and to provide a high expansion ratio that allow you to have a high specific impulse. So the high chamber pressure is especially necessary, and this is something that you already see, and as I'm sure that I emphasized it uh, since the beginning of this course, when the highest pressure allow us to have high expansion ratios at sea level, that means that also at sea level you can have high specific impulses. Specific impulse is the performance parameter for rockets. It's the, it's not one, it's the single or the most important performance parameter that we have in rockets. <clears throat> so then we have a sustainer stages. And this is typically what we have between the first stage to st or booster that is uh, providing you trust at liftoff. You have a second stage that is called often sustainer that works practically outside of the atmosphere. And so we would like to have a high another exit area for that and not necessarily such a high pressure. But of course, the pressure here works more as a scaling factor uh, that allow you to check the sides of your trot. And uh, about the, the fact that you like to have high expansion ratio, high performance, you recall, I've talked about that, and that we can have stages that are started at sea level and works also as a sustain sustainer later. And this can be a problem in terms of the realizable expansion ratio that you can have. And finally, we have also upper stages. Less pressure, less trust needed, and also less propellant mass fraction. And uh, finally, even lower amount of propellant is the one that is used typically in uh, reaction control and and satellite propulsion system. All this application can be uh, considered by liquid rocket engines with thrust levels going from a few millinewtons up to a few meganewtons. We, we talked about a few meganewtons for the solid motors. This kind of thrust level can are also achieved by liquid rocket engines. You, you recall, I don't know if I mentioned this kind of distinction of the two words, motors and engines, uh, that is, let's say, 
give you an idea of the more complicated uh, piping that you see in the, the liquid rockets. So uh, we go a wide range of uh, thrust level. I just would like to stress from few millinewtons up to meganewtons. So you see there are six order of magnitudes this. And, uh, and we will see, of course, depending on this kind of application, there will be different thrust level. We can stop now for the usual 10 minutes and we will resume at 310. <clears throat> è la camera di spinta che si, che, che, che si muove anche con i, i blocchi di turbopompa se ci sono ed è eh, cioè un giunto sì, diciamo così è soltanto la connessione il piping con il serbatoio che deve avere la flessibilità La risposta a Luca Collettini non l'ho sentita, se può provare di nuovo. Mi sente, prof? No, non la sento, un attimo che... Poi adesso? Mi sente? Adesso sì, non so perché si era... Mi si è attivato l'audio, aveva una domanda o qualcosa? Eh, sì, io personalmente volevo chiederle, ma eh, la lezione di cui ha parlato eh, riguardo al... Professor Dordain. 
Sì, ehm, si terrà sempre su questa piattaforma come al solito oppure ci no, sarà no. un altro metodo? Non glielo so dire ancora, non l'abbiamo organizzata ma probabilmente no, potrebbe essere un'altra piattaforma, ovviamente vi darò uh, certamente il link e eventuale codice della conferenza se cambiamo piattaforma, se dovesse essere uno zoom con, con, una, diciamo, con un invito, ovviamente inviterò tutti voi. Ok, perfetto. E c'era anche un altro ragazzo che ha fatto una domanda, però... Scusi, non l'ho capito. C'era anche un altro ragazzo che voleva fare una domanda, mi sembra che è Manuel Aiello. Eh sì, professore, volevo chiedere una cosa su, ancora sui razzi solidi. E, al di là delle, delle dimensioni, del, prima avevamo visto il boost dello Space Shuttle, al di là delle dimensioni del, del motore, qual è il vantaggio di eh, testare il motore a, verticalmente o orizzontalmente? Mm. Ok, sui solidi non c'è, diciamo, si fa anche orizzontalmente, così come si fa anche sui liquidi, ovviamente bisogna tener conto di qualche differenza dovuta all'effetto della gravità e anche a come si sviluppa poi la, la nube di scarico. Naturalmente c'è una semplicità maggiore del test orizzontale perché non bisogna creare spazio sotto e quindi quando questo è consentito è una scelta che può essere preferita. Eh, vantaggi particolari, diciamo così, che, che non ne vedo, anche perché vedo nelle immagini che mi passano di fronte test fatti in entrambe le direzioni per diversi tipi di propulsori, per esempio anche il Vulcan che è un propulsore al liquido viene provato orizzontalmente in Germania e verticalmente in Francia, stesso motore. E quindi non le so dare una risposta esauriente eh, diciamo così ci possono essere sicuramente c'è il fatto che provarli in verticale è eh, sicuramente più simile a quello che, che accade nella realtà però eh, ha come conseguenza ovviamente un probabilmente un maggior costo di test grazie mille So we can uh, assume now, and uh, as I was saying, is that uh, we have a range of thrust levels that we can consider for liquid rocket engines, and uh, so they can be also classified in terms of thrust level, 
and of course uh, in terms of propellants and also in terms of operation. And when I talk about operation, I'm meaning now that for liquid propellant rocket engines, we can consider also multiple starts. And so you can identify uh, an engine as restartable or not, as reusable or not, because we can also reuse them. And, uh, uh, and this can be something that, of course, makes a different design. And you can imagine that we can have launcher engines. That means that typically they are either started just once or a few times if we are considering an after stage, but you are considering a number of units. So one, two, three, four times. But you have also uh, liquid rocket engines working on satellites or on spacecrafts that can be working for a huge number of cycles, uh, tens of thousands of cycles. So tens of thousands of reignitions. And so, of course, this will make a difference in the design uh, of uh, the rocket. So often we will focus and we imagine our big rockets that are uh, part of a launcher, but of course we have also small rockets that have also to perform well to save propellant and mass and volume within a spacecraft. So uh, let's now to try to focus the different parts. Oh, just before doing that, just about the thrust levels. I had this plot that I'd like to show about the chamber pressure and thrust log log scale. So this is uh, 10 and second, third, four. And let's put also seven. So these are, this is the trust in Newton. And uh, we have pressure here in one, 10, 100, 1000 bar as the, the possible, let's say, to, to check the range where we are with different liquid rocket engines. We work from here, more or less, up to Yeah, more or less this region within this diagram, that means pressure from something less than 10 bar up to 200 roughly or 300 and uh, trust from uh, something more than, uh, of course there are also smaller, but this at least for the launcher stages, we are in this range where we find here, the, let's say the upper stages, here we find sustainer stages, and here we find the booster one. So this is sustainer, booster, and upper stages cover these regions. So boosters can go from 300 to from 30 to 300 bar, and with trust level from 10 to 6 to 10 to 7 newtons. Sustainer between 10 to 5, 10 to 6 as thrust level and from 10 to 150 bar as pressure and upper stages between 1000 and 100,000 Newton and uh, trust level with pressure level between 5 and 80. So the core uh, of our liquid rocket engines, we, we say that is the thrust chamber. So what is this thrust chamber? Now just to make, according to the former question, let's draw it in this time, vertical. And we have different parts of our thrust chamber. We have this region here, which is where we have that propellants are metered, injected, 
atomized mixed burn to form out gas. And then this other part where they are accelerated to high speed. So we have a region where all the mentioned phenomena occur, which are, I repeat them, metering of propellants, so they are put in the chamber with uh, a given injection system. So uh, method means that you have to give the right amount of propellant inside through the injection system inside the thrust chamber. Once you have these liquids, we are considering that we store propellant in liquid phase. And if we are injecting these propellants directly in the chamber, it means that they are reaching the chamber in liquid phase. And at this point, you have to get gas. You have to burn to, and that we will recall later, to do that, we need to, especially if we are considering a bipropellant system, so that we have separate fuel and oxidized, and you have to mix them before burning. And so you have to create, create small parts of propellant, small drops. That means this is called the atomization process. Then we have, once you have these drops, as a result of the atomization, you have to mix propellant. So you have a mixing phase. And only after mixing, they can burn to form out gases. So we identify the injector, the combustion chamber, where we have the reaction, and the nozzle. All together makes the thrust chamber. <clears throat> so, but uh, if this is the, the core component of a liquid rocket engine system, uh, we have to, before talking about that, we have, as I already did, we have to talk about propellants. So propellants, what, what means propellants here are the liquids that make the working substance of our rocket. And uh, we talk about propellants, solid propellant, liquid propellants, and the reason is that we can have separate propellants. Actually, uh, if we consider solid, again, comparing them, we have uh, different solid substances, and we have to put them together. But we have to realize a single solid material to have a solid rocket work as described. If I have a powder of oxidizer and a powder of fuel, I cannot use them in, in, in a rocket. I need the binder, I need something that can put them together, and after a, a, li a liquefaction and solidification, they form a single piece. Uh, of course, with liquids, with liquids are different. You can have your different liquids, and you can select among them. Uh, they have not to stay together in their tank. They have not to make a single shape together, and they are not to be manufactured together. So this uh, tell you that we have, in principle, a wide choice, wide choice of uh, substances provided that them can be stored in liquid phase. And uh, for this reason, we start from what we have seen in terms of performance. We, you recall that we have from the periodic table what can be the different, at least at atomic level, the different substances that can be more interesting. Then, of course, you can consider the different molecules which are available. And among them, you can identify possible reactants that provide you with the maximum heat release that you would like to get to have high performance. So this uh, to say that a very large number of widely different chemicals have been considered 
as possible propellant. Just to give you some figures, this is rep a representative number, 1800, of possible propellants that have been considered. Uh, and uh, together them, more or less the same number or slightly higher, of course, it should be higher, but, <clears throat> or at least we can expect it's higher, is the number of propellant combinations that have been considered. So these are propellants. And this is a figure representing the number of possible propellant combinations. But uh, despite we have this huge number, then if you go in practice, only a few tenths of propellant combination have been flown so far. So order of magnitudes like 30, 40, more or less. So of course, why so many? Because we try to realize the best performance. We, we try to have propellants showing high density in the third phase. Of course, the higher density means that occupy less volume. That means lighter tanks. And uh, also safe propellants, if possible, that allow the start without too many problems. Possibly today also we will say green propellants and uh, possible more or less advantages for possible reuse it could be also something for interest. And so in the considering the possible combination, there is a trade-off between uh, the, the toxicity, the high energy, the also about the cost, we should consider also the what we can call the logistic. That means if uh, we can also choose a propellant because we know that we have close to the launch base a huge amount of a forgiven substance. We, we don't want to consider something which is not easily available. So if there's something available, this could be an important reason to select a given propellant. So about uh, the chemical properties of propellants, the first classification is similar with some differences, but we, we have some commonalities with what we have seen for solid rockets. We have what we call monopropellant and what we call bipropellants. So you see that there is something similar. We had homogeneous, heterogeneous in the first case, in solid rocket, we had that both fuel and oxidizer were within the same molecule. And in the second case, we had separate molecules for fuel and oxidizer. And this is the same for monopropellant and bipropellant. In monopropellant, roughly, we can say that oxidized, oxidizer and fuel are within the same substance. And uh, this is not the case of bipropellant where we have separate fuel and oxidizer. So uh, what is the meaning? Actually, monopropellant is something that is unstable and that you can perturb in some way that we have a reaction occur that decomposes this substance with heat release as we desire. And uh, about bipropellants, as I said, we, we distinguish so we are considering monopropellants. And bipropellants. So single substance. And here we have fuel and oxidizer. stored separately. So fuel is a combustible matter. That means that uh, it produces, it will release energy if combined, if it reacts with an oxidizer, whereas oxidizer is an oxidizing agent. That means uh, something that uh, supports combustion with the fuel. 
of course, these are related to the fact that the, the substance will try to capture or release electrons in uh, uh, because of their uh, orbital arrangement of the electrons. So this is the first classification. So we see monopropellants and bipropellants. Another classification, another important classification for liquids is relevant to the storage conditions. Liquid phase. Simple. But we are not happy in saying that we need something which is liquid. Because we know that something can be liquid in given condition, given um, uh, ambient condition, and can, it can be gaseous or solid in different ambient conditions. Let's take water, of course, in these conditions. It's liquid, but of course, at low temperature will become solid, at high temperature will be, become gas. And this is true for all substances, obviously. And so we have to define what we intend with liquids in terms of propellants. So the first thing that we can say is to identify substances like water, which is not a propellant, but it's an example of something which is liquid in at ambient conditions. So if we identify substances that can be considered propellants and they are liquid at uh, ambient conditions, that means uh, one atmosphere of pressure and, uh, uh, let's say, 298 uh, Kelvin as the temperature, we call that this is a storable propellant. So that can be stored without problems or easily stored. So storable propellants means that they are liquid at ambient conditions. And this usually also means that you can store it for a long time because they will not change their phase. They will remain liquid. And you see that uh, so ambient condition here most mainly means ambient temperature. But anyway, let's say ambient conditions. And uh, so it means that you can keep this for a long time exactly as in principle happens for a solid. Our solid propellant can, can uh, be stored for a long time they are storable in this sense. But we can, uh, we are not satisfied because not everything is available uh, in these conditions. For instance, gasoline is for sure it's a fuel or alcohol, it's a fuel which is liquid at ambient conditions, so they are storable fuels. But what about the storable oxidizer? Uh, we know that a good oxidizer is oxygen, another good oxidizer is fluorine, and we have talked about them during the chemistry analysis, and, uh, but they are not liquid at ambient conditions. We have seen, we have talked about the reaction between oxygen and hydrogen, but hydrogen is not liquid at ambient conditions. So can the, the question that, of course, has a positive answer is that we can still store other substances which are not liquid at ambient condition, provided that we cool down them to low temperature. So what we can do is to get, in principle, there can be also substances that can be liquefied under pressure. But this is not always the case. Sometimes you need to, or uh, for the most interesting prop propellants, probably, you have to keep them at, bring them at very low temperature to bring them to liquid phase and to store as the liquids. Because, of course, you can also imagine to use 
hydrogen and oxygen, which are not, which are gaseous at ambient condition at this temperature. But they will occupy infinite volume because we are in gaseous phase. So you need to liquefy to reduce the volume. Despite uh, we have costs, and the cost is to bring them to a low temperature. So about the low temperature uh, storage of propellants to get the liquid phase, we identify different cases. We have a mild cryogenic propellant and hard cryogenic propellants. So the mild cryogenic are called space storable. Mild cryogenic propellant. So with cryogenic means that we have to liquefy at temperature lower than ambient. So to get them liquid, you have to stay at temperature which are lower than ambient. And in this case, we call the propellant as cryogenic. Mild cryogenic means that we don't need, we have to uh, consider lower than ambient temperature, but not dramatically lower. And uh, so this is why we call this mild cryogenic, and it's something that because of the lower temperature that we have in space, they can consider them as storable, not on Earth, but in space they are, can be considered storable because they remain in liquid phase. The third family is that of cryogenic propellants or hard cryogenic. That it means that you need a very low temperature and the temperature which are lower than dust that can be achieved in space. And this is typically uh, is mostly referred to hydrogen. <clears throat> so this is an important classification. This can be stored, storable means that can be stored for long times. Of course, you are considering cryogenic propellant. This is no longer true. And because of course we have a continuous heat exchange and you should provide power, you, you should cool down continuously to keep the propellant in liquid phase. And this is of course has a huge cost that cannot be afforded. So, Typically, if you are using cryogenic propellants, it means that you are filling your tanks last minute, let's say, and, uh, just before using the propellant itself. <clears throat> so, given this classification about storage, so we say that uh, we have Two classification of propellant by propellant or storable cryogenic. And in general, we, did, we, we have seen these three uh, possible classification for storage, but in general, we can also say uh, that we have storable versus uh, cryogenic propellants. Mm -hmm. We will consider, even if oxygen can be considered space storable, we will call them a cryogenic propellant commonly. Uh, so, which are the properties that we would like to find in propellants? How we select propellants? So, of course, they uh, have to be easy to be produced, available, easily to handle, and easily to and that should be easily stored. So, uh, we should find a compromise between uh, good and bad properties. And which are good properties? High performance, high density. Also, we will see also having high specific heat because this is means them suitable for cooling. Low cost, low vapor pressure, stable combustion, long time storage. These are good qualities. 
What could be the bad qualities? Toxicity, corrosivity, flammability, smoky plumes in case of military applications. And uh, also decay of properties during storage. This could be a bad quality. The fact that we may have a high freezing point, so they become solid because they are cold in a cold day. Or the tendency to produce combustion instabilities. So, of course, we have to consider trade-off and uh, one important thing is to consider toxicity and uh, the fact that we have we are liquid in uh, the archaeogenic or stormwater propellants these are important uh, aspects because you have to handle toxic propellants with uh, safety and this is an additional cost you have to handle cryogenic propellant because you have to work at low temperature and this has a, a strong cost so on this considering toxicity and the cryogenicity of propellants these bring with them additional costs related to the uh, safety provisions the stepping operations and also the fact that you have to consider uh, trained personnel for that recall that at the end cost is always uh, main hours So important aspect that does relevant to the assaults that are given by our propellants. We cannot imagine that uh, we work with something which is completely safe because we like to produce a huge amount of energy. So in general, you have to consider that we have something which is dangerous and we never will get something which is totally harmless. So it's it's in the propellant itself uh, the fact that they are ready to release energy and so in principle they are dangerous so we have to consider the assaults that comes from them and uh, manage uh, manage them manage this kind of problem uh, i mentioned also toxicity but uh, it's not only the fact that you, uh, it's not only related to health problems, to the fact that you can breathe some poisonous vapors, for instance, is not, not the only problem. There is also the problem of uh, corrosion or of reactions with uh, the, the materials that are typically used as uh, uh, to contain the propellants or uh, with materials used typically for realizing pipelines and uh, in particular the material compatibility is also related to the fact that you imagine that you have different pipes and uh, as in your bedroom or in your kitchen you have to connect different pipes and at their connection you have to avoid leakage and to avoid leakage, there will be some O-rings or gaskets that are usually made with specific materials like rubber or also metals, but uh, are such that they are able to prevent, prevent leakage. And of course, there should be the compatibility of the propellant with such kind of devices. If you have leakage, you have dangers coming from uh, the leakage of uh, something which is a propellant, so in principle, is dangerous because it's ready to react. So about the physical properties that I would like, uh, I, I will then see a list of uh, the main propellants. We will discuss them and we would like to emphasize which are the physical properties we have to consider for them. So, propellant.
physical properties that we are interested in. So one is the, its freezing point. So when it becomes solid, and we like to have a low freezing point such that it will solidify. So it's in, we would like that it is unlike that will reach solidification condition. For instance, under cold weather condition, we don't like to have that our propellant solidifying. And uh, then, so we decide this possibly low. Another physical property of propellant is its density or specific gravity. You mentioned this with this word because you find this wording somewhere. And about density of propellants, you already mentioned we like to have it as high as possible to occupy less volume in our tanks, to have smaller tanks. Then, stability. What's the meaning of stability here? The fact that they remain as they are for long times. I can find an uh, a nice molecule as possible propellant, but this is not stable. That means that it's changed during time. One example, H2O2 is uh, hydrogen peroxide, which is could be an interesting oxidizer. But if you store it for long times, it it tends to it tends to decay in water and oxygen. And so this is something that is not stable. So this is the meaning of this stability. So you, for after a long time, we no longer have in our, if we still have the, 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 the tank, we don't have H2O2 or hydrogen peroxide, but we have water and oxygen. But probably we have not our tank available. And uh, then properties related to heat transfer. Uh, this is because we will see that we like to use propellants also as coolants. And so uh, it's good that we have good heat transfer properties. The vapor pressure and uh, this means that vapor pressure means the tendency of our liquid to vaporize. And if we have low vapor pressure, it means that we have to reach low pressures to, to bring the propellant from the liquid to the gaseous phase. So this is a desirable property. That is the fact of having low vapor pressure so that we don't vaporize our propellant. And uh, you'll see that this can be the thing also for pump performance to have this low vapor pressure, possibly low. And then we have thermal expansion. Also here, like in solids, uh, we have to, to, to think that we have this, we can have a huge amount of propellant in a tank. And if we have a change of density and so a change of volume of the propellant with temperature, we have to size our tank accordingly to leave room for the propellant to expand. So, 
So this uh, additional volume would should be the minimum as mean uh, as low as possible. So it would be better if the thermal expansion of the propellant is low. So here it transfer means also specific heat. Possibly high specific heat is better for a coolant because we extract heat without a big change of temperature. Uh, then what more? Uh, yes, nothing really special. So with these properties, now we, we examine examine this kind of properties for different for different uh, propellants, and we start with the oxidizers. And the first oxidizer I will consider is oxygen. So is oxygen an oxidizer? Yes. There is the question, I think, uh, among the ones I'm providing to you, is, is oxygen an oxidizer or a fuel? Answer this question. <laughs> uh, well, the first one we consider is oxygen. And we find oxygen as O2 as O2 molecule with a molar mass of 32 kilogram per kilomol is what we have seen also in our exercises. So what we are interested in now to talk about properties of this uh, substance as a possible liquid propellant is to see what is its range in liquid phase. So we can uh, look to the state diagram. Pressure, temperature, and identify uh, special points in this diagram. What we see typically for most species, for most molecules, is to see something like this, where we have the different phase uh, region. We have vapor here at low pressure, typically. And we have solid phase here and liquid phase here. And uh, we identify a point, which is the critical point. And we have the end of our saturation line. This is critical temperature, and this is critical pressure. This is the tribal point, where we uh, pass from the, the line which separates vapor and solid phase, so we have sublimation. Here, for instance, from solid vapor, and here we have liquefaction uh, or vaporization between liquid and vapor, and freezing uh, or liquefaction between solid and liquid. Mm. So, what uh, happens for hydrogen? What you see also here, like to uh, highlight also this, you see that the passage from solid to liquid is more or less vertical line. That means that the freezing temperature doesn't change much with pressure. So we say that the freezing point is more or less well defined at all pressure. Uh, then we have here the pressure of 
one atmosphere where we have these points here along our lines that identify the change of phase in normal conditions. So let's see where these points are placed. For uh, the first point is the normal boiling point, which is the uh, liquefaction temperature or the boiling temperature at one atmosphere. So this is the boiling point. And for oxygen is 90 Kelvin. Another noticeable point here is the freezing point, which is this one. And you see that it's quite similar, the temperature that you have at this freezing point, a normal condition, and the travel point. And they are placed here at 54 Kelvin. So we say that the freezing point Yes, 54 Kelvin. So what you see here, we see that at one atmosphere, the range where we have liquid oxygen is between 54 and 90 Kelvin. Can we extend this range? In principle, we can extend the range because you see that if we move up to higher pressure, we have that the range of temperatures is enlarged because the freezing point doesn't change much whereas we have an increase of the boiling temperature value. But you can also see that we have a limit even by the critical temperature, and so we have also to consider the critical temperature is 155 Kelvin. And also the fact that to reach this value in liquid phase, we need to increase pressure, and the critical pressure is about 50 bar. So you see that to, in any case, you have to stay at low temperature to have liquid oxygen, and uh, especially if you like to keep it at low pressure. And you will see that it's important to have storage at low pressure, because if you store at high pressure, you will have heavy tanks. So we don't like to have heavy tanks. We like to have high cham pressure, chamber pressure, but we don't want to have high pressure in tanks. So we like to store liquids at reasonable pressure. Uh, about uh, the specific gravity, we have 1.14 times water, so more or less like water. So it is gram per cubic centimeter, and we have 1.14, 1.14 for the oxygen. So the vapor pressure, if we liquefy the oxygen at 90 Kelvin, so it means that we have vapor pressure of one atmosphere, which is not low, a low pressure. So it's if we are at the boiling, just the condensation point, it means that we are ready to vaporize again. So we like to keep the vapor pressure, for instance, lower than one atmosphere. We should subcool the uh, the uh, liquid. That means, for instance, if you are here, our vapor pressure is lower because it's this one. And uh, so if we are storing this in one atmosphere, we have a significantly lower uh, vapor pressure compared to the storage pressure. And finally, the other property that I would like to list here is the specific heat. As for density, we compare this with water and this point for the uh, specific heat of uh, water. Uh, 
And um, for water, you know that this is the reference value is for one at six joule kilogram Kelvin. This is the equivalent. This is the calorie, one calorie. <clears throat> so, uh, what we see for the oxygen, we can we see this pro these properties. And we can see that we cannot store it for a long time on Earth uh, because of uh, it's cryogenic. But it can be, it's not another cryogenic. It's mild cryogenic and it, it can be considered as phase storable. In general, it's not uh, a big, uh, a very, big, a very good coolant. Typically, the specific heat will be higher for fuels than for oxidizer, but still provides reasonable performance, and so it can be considered as a coolant. So there is uh, no problem in producing liquid oxygen. It's well known how to do it. It's used widely also in hospitals, for instance. And uh, so it's a known technology. And uh, it's not corrosive, not toxic does not deteriorate, but is dangerous and is prone to react as soon as temperature is, is, becomes higher. It can provide high performance uh, and uh, with different possible fuels. It can be used with different possible fuels as, will, as, we, will see, as we will see in the next classes. So we started with oxygen, we will consider other oxidizer and the main, so we'll consider the main oxidizer and fuels, uh, their properties so that we can compare them with each other. And we have in this way, a clear idea of what are the propellants that are used in liquid propulsion. So we stop uh, here today. And uh, next class will be on Friday. Right? Venerdì facciamo 12-14. Eh, diciamo che in generale, tra l'altro, voi avete detto oggi di farlo anche prima, no? Avete detto l'orario precedente, che sarebbe 12-14, in realtà non è possibile, perché c'è la parte di strutture in inglese. <coughs>